Hello everybody and welcome to Toy 2 to You Curator's Corner episode number 23. My name's Sean Brosnan, I'm a curator at Toy 2 Otago Settlers Museum here in Dunedin. I began making these little videos about early Dunedin history during the coronavirus lockdown and now I'm just keeping them going. In the last episode I talked about how crime-free Pioneer Dunedin was and by that I meant serious crimes, rapes, murders, robberies, those sorts of things. Of course there were Less serious uh, petty crimes going on, uh, drunkenness, uh, sailors who deserted their ships, uh, minor assaults, uh, those sorts of things. And we can probably assume too there was a fair amount of domestic violence that never came to public attention. But it would seem that Dunedin's primitive pioneer jail was only ever full of runaway sailors and drunks. Now this crime-free status was a real source of pride to the pioneer population. It was frequently referenced in their newspaper, but it also led to a growing resentment about how much the uh, criminal justice system they did have was costing the settlers. Now, to begin with, that focused on Judge Stephen, the subject of our last episode, his enormous salary and all the trappings that went with his Supreme Court while it lasted in Dunedin. But once that was abolished, the resentment turned to Magistrate Alfred Cheatham Strode and his small group of policemen. Now, I guess it's pretty obvious from that double-barreled surname that Alfred Cheatham Strode was an Englishman. He'd been in Wellington, where he'd served for some time, and then he was sent down here by the governor in 1848 to be on hand when the settlers arrived with a small group of policemen. And on that basis alone, he was going to be resented by the Scottish pioneers. But when you add to that, that he was very active in establishing the Anglican Church here in Dunedin, they had two strikes against him. But those matters were secondary to a growing resentment about the cost of Alfred Cheatham Strode's policemen and their uselessness. I mean, where was a policeman when you needed him? Well, actually, they never needed him. That was the problem. There was no crime in early Dunedin, no need for the policemen, but they cost a lot and they were just a bit of a nuisance hanging around. So eventually, in 1854, the newly constituted Otago Provincial Government slashed the cost of police, got rid of most of them, but then, out of the blue, on the 1st of June 1855, Otago suffered its first really serious crime. It was a robbery, a break-in at the Custom House at Port Chalmers, and the thieves, there had to be more than one of them, had managed to get away with the safe containing over £1,400 worth of customs dues, which was a serious sum of money and potentially a real loss to the colony, as well as all the customs transactions. Now, it had happened on what had been literally a dark and stormy night, though they did have a full moon to guide them in their nefarious activities. And someone had crawled under the floor of the custom house. It was a um, weatherboard building set up on piles about two feet off the ground without any enclosure, so they managed to get under pretty easily. They cut a hole in the floor and made their way inside. And once in there, they cut another hole in the wall of the um, structure, just the right shape and size to shuffle out the safe, push it through to the accomplice outside, they dragged it down to the shoreline, into a boat, and away. Now this precision suggested advanced planning, and the timing too, because it was right at the end of the month when the um, customs dues would have been at their fullest in the safe, suggested it was an inside job, by which I don't mean someone in the customs service, but someone from within that pioneer community. So yeah, it was a real shock for them to discover that someone amongst them was just a sneaky old thief. So they were a bit rocked by this. And meanwhile, of course, the hunt was on for the uh, thieves and for the safe. So the port was shut forthwith. No ships were allowed to sail away. And a posse was got together. Because it had been a getaway by um, water, it was all boatmen. And various boats were dispatched to scour the harbour, every little bay, every nook and cranny, looking for any sign of the thieves or indeed of the safe. Now, of course, a huge crowd soon gathered to watch proceedings, the traditional uh, rubberneckers, which are always gathered together by dramas such as this. And as they watched the boats making their progress from the harbour, they noticed one boat heading up past Deborah Bay divert off in towards Pulling Point. Yes, indeed, they had spotted the safe. A little corner of it was just sticking out of the water at low tide. Now, it turned out that the thieves had bungled the operation. They had tipped the safe off the boat into the edge of the shore and they had a great go at smacking into it with a hammer. The broken hammer, its handle had snapped, was lying there beside it. They had managed to um, bolt, break off one of the bolts. There was a bit of a gap and some of the coins from inside had tumbled into the water and most of them were recovered. But 
they hadn't opened it. So with the safe up and back into home base, when it was open, it was discovered that almost all of the money and all of the official records were still there. So there wasn't going to be a huge loss to the Otago Treasury after all. But the big question was, who had done it? And would the police be worth the assaults and be able to track down the criminals in their first big case? Now, to be fair, there wasn't much for Strode uh, to go on. No forensics as such, except that when they were cutting that hole through the wall, they had struck a four-inch long iron spike that was embedded in the wall, and it must have caused some damage to the, teeth, to the teeth of any saw that had been used. Now, this seemed like a clue, and on that basis, a search party was dispatched to go house to house and examine everyone's saw for any sign of missing teeth. Wow, even in 1855, that must have been quite a job. And as it turned out, it was fruitless. They never found anyone. In due course, the whole population of Port Chalmers had to be uh, trooped past uh, Magistrate Strode and the provincial solicitor John Hyde Harris, a process that took six days. We know that from the account presented by Hyde Harris, the provincial government, for his time. But no damage saw was discovered. Nobody had seen or heard a thing. And eventually, the miscreants just got away with their crime, but not with their loot. And eventually Dunedin's pioneer population went back to sleeping soundly at night. But I guess at least they had to forgo all that boastfulness about pioneer Dunedin's crime-free status. The run had been broken.